Well, welcome to the class. This is certainly the first Skype class that I've ever done, but uh, we've all read the book, The Meeting of the Waters, and uh, Wes and Courtney are going to tell our author, uh, Fritz Kling, a little bit about their experience in the book. Go ahead, Wes. I think we can see you. Yeah, real quick. Fritz, can you hear the students okay? I can hear you, and I heard uh, Professor Hank. I can't. I haven't heard okay. any students yet. Okay, we haven't had them talk yet, so. <laughs> Go ahead, Wes. Hi, friends. My name's Wes. Hi. I heard you say hi. <laughs> <laughs> well, my name's Wes. Uh, here, I'll come over here. But, uh, <laughs> this is so awkward. <laughs> 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 but uh, <laughs> that's a lot. Of, that's a lot of Wes. Uh, my, my name is Wes. I'm a senior here at Sterling. Um, I really appreciated this book uh, as I'm kind of interested in missions and, and ministry in general. Um, I think we spend a lot of time studying history. We spend a lot of time uh, seeing where we've been, looking into the past, and as invaluable as that is and will continue to be, uh, we don't spend much time looking into the future. Uh, and I think oftentimes that's left to students to do themselves. And, and I appreciate it, um, that you compiled that and used your experience and, and your knowledge and your foresight uh, to look in and, and kind of give us that guide going forward. So that's what, what I really appreciate about it. Thanks. 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 Yeah, I'll, I'll respond to that, and um, that's been my experience, has been that um, Christians, Bible-believing Christians, are really good at looking at the past, and, um, you know, whether it's through the, the sacred texts, the Bible, or whether it's through stories of great Christian mission leaders, George Car um, uh, Hudson Taylor, Adoniram Judson, William Carey, uh, those people. So we're really good at lifting up those people. Uh, and I think we give a little thought to the, like, really far off future, like uh, apocalyptic times and uh, eschatology. Uh, but I think it's that middle ground where we're not so great. I don't think we're so great at figuring out uh, how do we contextualize the, the Bible story and God's narrative for today's culture and maybe even more important, tomorrow's culture. That's become um, especially imperative as the world is changing so much. And you know, I guess there's a Chinese problem that says you can't step in the same uh, stream twice. And I think that's true with our world today. You know, just because you knew what was happening yesterday uh, doesn't mean you know what's going to be happening tomorrow because it's changing so fast. So what I tried with the book was to give people tools for looking at and understanding the future, not by telling them this is the way it's going to be, or this is what's going to happen, or it's going to play out this way, because I don't know that. I don't know how it's going to happen tomorrow. But for giving them, uh, to give them tools to do that on their own. And further, if I could tell you the way it was going to happen in Richmond, Virginia, where I live, that wouldn't be the way it would happen tomorrow would look like in Sterling, or in Jakarta, or in Yangon, et cetera, et cetera. So, more than hard and fast answers or to-do lists or checklists, we need to have tools for figuring out um, how is everything changing or how, we, how are we going to adapt. I think um, the business world does that very well. They have to because they every day they have a one loss record, right? It's called the, the Dow Jones. And you can see whether companies went up or down. And uh, uh, the celebrity world does that well and marketing does that well. and so many industries or fields do that well. I don't think that the Christian world um, makes a practice of regularly keeping up with how is society changing, how do we need to change in order to adapt to that. So that's been a kind of a passion of mine. The other one is that I think a lot of times for churchgoers, uh, people have made maybe missions boring. They think of missions as being boring, and that's a, that's a crime. It's nothing like that. And so um, I think live, real-world stories of what's happening and how it's not 
um, different and this weird outpost, but actually very much vitally involved with society, I think those are good messages to send to the church at large. So um, that was the intention. I'm glad that that worked for you, Wes. I'd like uh, Courtney to come up now and uh, give her a bit of her perspective. She can maybe talk where she is. I don't know. That might work. Let me try this and see. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. Um, for me, I really appreciated, I got from the book that the world is in a constant state of change and that we are constantly having to adapt. Um, and I think that's something that I got to experience firsthand was last summer I got to go to India for three months. And so some of the stories that you told and the currents that you talked about, I experienced firsthand, whether I saw them or um, I actually got to live them out a little bit. Um, but I realized that I really don't know as much as I thought I did and just saw that the world is changing and that I'm going to have to, I don't know, um, learn how to incorporate these currents even more. And it's just excited to see how the church is going to continue to use these currents in the future. I also really appreciated your stories. Um, they were fascinating to me. Um, I don't know. They were just very, very intriguing and very personal. And they're also different. And they just opened my eyes to the extent of missions in general. That's great. Thanks, Courtney. Um, yeah, one thing I, um, I'm passionate about and I would commend to you all is being constant um, question askers and being listeners. I called that the survey I did, um, the Global Church Listening Tour, and um, uh, I found that when I went around uh, to different people in different countries and told them, I just asked them to tell me about their context for an hour. Um, they were shocked and then maybe a little suspicious because they just didn't know what to do with an American man uh, with money not my own but nevertheless I you know was giving away money um, who came and listened to them because their experience was really much more often with Americans coming and telling them and uh, so I found that really the secret tool or weapon wherever I go around the world is asking lots of questions and then listening and in the process what happens is you get tutored or mentored by you know the world's smartest people in their context so I think um, um, I, I think that also sig you know it signals a posture of humility and of mutuality that's something we really need to do as Americans going to the rest of the world because We've had so many resources that are avail for so long, and we, I think, have stewarded those in, in faithful ways. However, after, you know, it's just it's like I went to Duke University. Everyone hates Duke basketball because they've been on top for so long. It's just inevitable. And I think the same thing clearly happens with the U.S. We've been a superpower for a long time. We've known it. Everybody knows it. And um, so I think people are tired of Americans telling them what to do. So a real, I think, marching order for us in the coming years is to look for ways to come alongside people and partner with them instead of telling them. A good way to start doing that is by asking questions, by trying to understand their context, their environment. Um, a lot of times if you do that, you will be able to identify and kind of intuit or understand um, those landmines that you might otherwise step on. The sensitivities, the concerns, the resentments, the fears, the weaknesses, the things that all of us have and every culture has. It's a good idea to try to figure those out before wading in with answers or pre-programmed um, initiatives. And I think that probably came through in the book, just one of uh, eagerness to hear stories and to listen and to learn. Um, as far as the stories go, I, one of the things that inspired me was, I don't know if any of you have read uh, The World is Flat or The Lexus and the Olive Tree by Thomas Friedman. But if you haven't, I really recommend those books. They were bestsellers. Friedman writes for the New York Times. And um, 
he deals with really, really complex issues and does it through stories. He's a great storyteller. And um, I kind of began to realize that's a great way to take on very complex concepts and deal with them. So the stuff I deal with in the book is very complex. Um, memory mostly has to do with post-colonialism and how countries operate uh, after they have shed their colonial um, trappings. And that's a really complex topic. And there are all kinds of dissertations written on that. Um, but in my little chapter, I was able to broach it just through a bunch of stories that I think pe help people to understand that. The concept of duality is very, very complex. And anthropologists have written about that, and uh, intercultural, just sociologists, and things like that. But I think these topics are so important and germane that people who care about missions, that I wanted to try to find someone to popularize them and to put the goodies on the way to blow shelf so that they're accessible to lots of people. And, and also, I mean, quite admittedly, I'm not an expert in any of those fields, so I couldn't go but so much deeper anyway. Hi there, Fritz. Hank here. Hi, Hank. Uh, I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about your, your life in, in maybe three or four minutes. Just as sure. a background, we call sure. the book, but hear a bit more about you. Sure, and I'm going to close these blinds. Yeah, I, um, I've lived in Richmond, Virginia for 30 years, um, and um, I have three kids, two are out of school. They went to the College of William Mary. One is at the University of Virginia. And um, I uh, went to Duke University as an undergraduate. Then I graduated and taught school for a few years and coached. And then I went to um, law school and practiced law for a while. After that, I uh, worked at a university, actually, in, in fundraising. And um, <coughs> For the last 13 years, I've run foundations. Um, for eight of those years, I ran a, a family foundation based in Richmond. And for the last six, I've run one based in Wichita, which is how I got to know Sterling. Um, the foundation I run now focuses on the country of Myanmar, Burma. And um, so I'll be, uh, I've been there twice in the last four months and I'll go back in May and then again in September and again in January. Um, Myanmar is a fascinating place currently because um, uh, it's opening up very dramatically. For 60 years it had been closed and uh, run by, by um, a junta some, by the military. And the military was socialist at times. Um, and then just recently, the Nobel Prize winner, Aung San Suu Kyi, was released from house arrest probably about two years ago and recently elected to parliament. So now she's a member of parliament. So the country is opening up dramatically. It's kind of changing more than other, any other country on the face of the earth, probably. So our uh, the DeBoer Foundation is going to be starting a uh, DeBoer Fellows program there, where each year we will train, oh, 25 or more um, leaders of nonprofits from around the country. A lot of them have not had access to um, good education. The universities have been closed from time to time, and so um, we're going to try to come alongside these people and. Um, train them to run their organizations um, and kind of backfill a lot of those skills that they might not have learned in college. So I think these people will be between 25 and 40 typically and uh, each year we're going to have a class of 
I don't know, 25, 30 DeBoer Fellows from around the country. So it's really exciting. It's a very, it's a real complex undertaking, and um, but it's very strategic. You know, I think in 10 years there could be 300 DeBoer Fellows in that country, and we're going to train them in two things, really. One is organizational effectiveness as leaders, how to run their organizations better, and the other one is in character and values. Things like servant leadership, shared governance, uh, transparency, things like that. So um, that's uh, that's what I'm doing currently. And uh, the book I wrote I, um, about three years ago, I guess, was based on surveys of Christian leaders around the world. And uh, I've had the chance to meet so many amazing uh, leaders from different countries and um, at some point I just decided I, I, I wanted to put it all together in some kind of format so um, and I wanted to capture the trends that I was observing and that's how the meeting of the waters came about well excellent I think we must try to have some students uh, Raise your hand if you have a question you'd like to ask. Uh, Jared, I think, if you can point it that way. Jared, I'm sorry. Kick off for us. Okay. Okay. Introduce yourselves as you, as you get the opportunity. Um, I'm Jared Reimer. I went to Christian College and my Christian Ministries major with uh, missions emphasis. So I found your book really um, enlightening in the sense of uh, planning on going into the mission field, whether it be international or um, national here in the States. So uh, um, one thing that I connected with was the Apple guy, and I had a question here about it. Um, so if we consider Apple Guy and all of his or her technology, I feel like um, when we take all this new fancy technology um, outside and use it in front of local and international friends um, who maybe don't even have enough uh, food to eat or money to pay for schooling or education, that we're perhaps putting them in a spot where we're almost leading them to temptation or to um, covet those things. I mean, I think it's an issue that Apple Guy has to deal with. And so how does Apple Guy deal with this issue in a world where cultures are changing so um, rapidly and technology is playing such a vital role that maybe perhaps even overshadow um, an effective witness for Christ? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks. Um, I have a few thoughts. One is, um, you said you're thinking about going to missions. You're not sure it's going to be international or domestic. One thing about the Meeting of the Waters that I've kind of become more aware of ever since I wrote it even has been that, um, how applicable the trends are um, domestically where you live. And like in Sterling, I know Sterling isn't exactly LA, and um, trends don't necessarily start in Sterling, but they end up there at some point. And I think that um, you're going to see more and more of the trends. You probably see migration. I mean, I know. In Wichita, there are a lot of immigrants, and I'll bet you're seeing them around you. And so all these trends, even if they aren't the global currents, even if they're not obvious in Sterling right away or your hometown, they will be. That's because they're part of globalization, and globalization is, is um, spreading everywhere. Hey, Fritz, we lost you for a few minutes. Could you rewind and repeat what you said the past minute or so? Yeah. Sorry about that. What was I saying when I stopped? Uh, you stopped. Something about Wichita was the last thing we heard. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, um, the trends, the global currents are spreading the world, and they are um, being carried by globalization. Globalization isn't going to stop. I mean, one of the things I tried to say in my chapter on uh, monoculture is that one of the things that's feeding globalization is companies and their marketing. And nothing is more predictable than um, global companies continue to marketing because that's where their money comes from. So, hey, all Fritz. Of this, yep. Yes. 
<laughs> okay, we we lost you at monoculture that time. Okay. <laughs> okay. Can you hear us now? I can hear you. Okay, sorry. Let's can you start from monoculture again. Sorry about that. Sure. Okay. Um, one of the things about monoculture is that it um, spreads global currents around the world. Globalization is um, being fueled by companies and their desire to develop new markets. So if you look at a place that was formerly unreached or untouched, there are global companies that have a lot of incentive to change that. That's why global currents are going to more and more penetrate places like Sterling and the towns that you're from. So that's the first point. You asked about Apple Guy and um, the technology. I think that's always a challenge for Americans and people with wealth as they deal with people who don't have wealth. Um, to try to avoid ostentation. Uh, that said, um, it's amazing how all around the world, uh, when I was in Myanmar in January, uh, more people had iPads there than ever before, and I don't have one. And so these people want to begin to acquire the trappings that come with being part of the rest of the world. It's a tough balance because you know, a lot of times that untouched native concept we have, when, when they've been exposed to more and more of what we enjoy in the rest of the world, they begin to want it. So increasingly what we have to combat around the world is materialism. And that's a big problem. So um, at the same time, too, missionaries I've seen around, nobody uses technology more than missionaries. They're often on the road. They're often away from their family. They're often at conferences with other people. Being wired and connected is very, very important to them. So um, it's a good question. I think avoiding ostentation is very, very important. Uh, personally, when I go and meet with people, a lot of times I'll just have a, a notebook and write in that just because I want to avoid the barrier of bringing my Mac or something else. Um, I also try to, for instance, when I'm in Yangon and I'm meeting with nationals, with, uh, with Burmese people, I'll meet at a little tea shop across the street instead of the lobby of the hotel where I'm staying, just because I think they're more comfortable and more natural. So there are things we can do and should do um, to try to make it all more equitable. Uh, I do think that going around with all of the technology stuff, I think that's a problem, and we need to be aware of that. Yeah, I, you, you usually can't go wrong by leaving your gadgets at home, but uh, at the end of the day, they know that they go back to a different place than you do. I mean, I often think about that when I go to restaurants in, in the developing world. And the people who wait on me, they just look impeccable and they're dressed in their uniform and all that. And very often I think to myself, they go back to shanties that I, they would make me shudder. And they spend the night there, then they clean up and come in and wait on rich people. And um, so that is the reality. It's a hard one. You, but uh, uh, I think sensitivity to, you, to it is a good start. And... Uh, Probably a lot of Americans are not sensitive to that because we're just so used to wealth. Um, I'll tell you something interesting I saw last night. Last night I attended a banquet here in Richmond for uh, Richmond Justice Initiative. It's like uh, there's this thing in Wichita called ICTSOS, which is an anti-trafficking organization. And trafficking organizations are spreading up anti-trafficking all around the world. And it's part of what I call in my first chapter the mercy generation. And um, trafficking is a cause for your age. It's amazing how widespread, how, um, yeah, how passionate your generation is about combating trafficking. It's just really uh, 
resonated with you all. <clears throat> and uh, it got me to thinking about mercy, the Mercy Generation and about Apple Guy. And, um, you know, the question, I, the question is, is Apple Guy, how committed is Apple Guy going to be? We know Mission Marm was very committed, but Mission Marm is not updating or learning enough necessarily or nimble enough. I mean, how uh, a 55 or 60 year old who's been in the field for 20 years, I think there are going to be limitations to how current they can be. So, um, but a few years ago, I was at a um, we had about 15 Sterling students come to Wichita and they met with the head of the DeBoer Foundation, me with Jack DeBoer, President Maurer was there and somebody from World Vision. And Matt was there. Um, and it was interesting because so many of them were thinking about going into careers and missions. So I think in a lot of ways you guys are kind of in the middle between Mission Marm and Apple Guy. You still have this idea about going into the missions field long term and that's a really good thing. More and more when I talk to young people they'll tell me, oh yeah I support that group and what they mean is they clicked on the like button on Facebook. You know that one that has this on it? And they, that's their support. And some places call that slacktivism. It's really lame. And so I think there's this huge gap between those of you who view a career in missions and you're thinking about all that you can sacrifice and going there maybe for a long time. And then those other ones who will go to this anti-trafficking banquet and they'll click on like on Facebook. And um, I don't know where it's all heading, but I do wonder about the commitment of the Apple guy folks and uh, what, will, uh, what will missions look like in the future. I don't know. I really love the passion that I see in your generation um, and the commitment. And I just think it's really important for someone out there, the, the Dr. Hanks or the other people in the world, to call you to a really high standard and to tell you slack division doesn't cut it. And if you go somewhere for three years, go all out, do your best, and learn what it's like to pitch in with something completely and not just click from one thing to another to another, which I think is kind of part of the challenge of your generation. I call, I, I, I've thought about another book and that would be on millennials because that just interests me greatly and I've thought about calling it optionholics because I think, I, I think your generation, my kids, I think you're optionholics. I think you have so many options and you just want to keep them open and that's why I like Sterling is that it, I think it's encouraging you to take this idea of missions really seriously and to go deep with it even if it's for a few years and um, not to dabble in stuff but to you know that God calls us to to sacrifice and to seriousness and soberness so uh, that's what I thought of last night at that banquet any other questions Hi, my name is Darren Casey. I'm from Colorado. I'm a junior and I'm a psychology major. And um, reading your book, um, my my question is to you um, personally. Um, when writing these seven different currents, in your opinion, which one do you think is going to be the most leading and most impactful in the near future? Yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, I think if I were to do it again, you know what? I think I'd probably include something about uh, women. I, I'd probably include a current about women uh, in the future. I, a couple of the people I featured in there, the stories of them were women, and that was intentional. But um, I think I might have done. Some, I, I might add that. But the one that's most important, I think, the one that's most overarching would probably be mutuality. Monoculture is pretty obvious. Anybody who goes on a mission trip anywhere comes back and talks about monoculture. You know, I was in Guatemala and the guy was wearing a LeBron James t-shirt or whatever. And, and that's true. It's really a shocking thing. And that's an example of globalization. Um, 
And that's one of the more obvious ones. But I think something that's not obvious at all is mutuality. And that is um, the need for us, wherever we go around the world as followers of Christ, to partner with other followers in, of Christ, again, as partners and not as leaders and followers. I think the 20th century had a lot more of that for several reasons. One was the inequity of power, the inequity of wealth. Uh, there were more unreached places that hadn't heard the name of Jesus. Uh, there were more unreached reached places, period, where outsiders had not been. All of that is changing. And so um, I think when we go somewhere, we should assume we're not the first outsiders to come with a message. And, may, and also, we're not going to be the last. So that both takes pressure off us. It also removes any messianic complex or illusions we might have. Um, and that's a good thing. And this is true on short-term mission trips, too, I think. You don't have to just go through and just serve everybody notice during your week there that Jesus is Lord and they need to learn about him when, and commit to him. Um, you're probably part of a stream of people who are bearing that message. Um, uh, so that's one thing. Another thing is that all these countries that we used to reach out to um, with teaching and with resources, um, a lot of them are generating that internally now. They have their own scholars. They have, they're educated. They're very learned. They're more and more able to interact with people from other countries and going to conferences and studying abroad, et cetera, et cetera. So the need for Americans to come in with all of the resources that they need in terms of their Christian future, it's not like it used to be. Now they can handle a lot of that internally. And so, uh, I mean, I look at my, my mom grew up in the jungles of Brazil, and her parents started a school there. The uh, people there hadn't learned to look, uh, to read, and they would not have, except for these Mennonite missionaries. And so um, that was in the 1940s. Now, you know, they're, uh, what used to take probably three and a half days is now a two-hour drive. And they're within uh, probably an hour and a half of an airport, and they can fly anywhere else in the world from there. So it's so different. All that to say, we need to learn to partner with people now, with countries and with, with um, people we interact with in other countries. Uh, and that's a hard thing. When any of you go home and, and see your parents, do they ever treat you like you're still a little kid? Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same now when Americans go to other countries and we're used to treating other countries like they're needy and like they're lesser and like we're the what the, what's called the patron and they're the client and that is that colonial relationship it is very toxic it's very toxic and it ticks everyone off it makes them just bitter resentful and so we just need to bust wide open that patron-client relationship, and we need to come in as servants and as partners. And in many cases, we need to oversell that because they, they never expect us to come in as humble partners. They never expect us to come in as learners, as people who can learn from them. So when I've done my global church listening tour, one of my favorite question was, um, what would you want missionaries coming into your country to know about your people? They, people love answering that question because it gives them a chance to be known and to declare who they are and what makes their people special. And usually their answers would be something like, we have a very rich social structure. We have very thick bonds of relationship. We uh, are a church that <clears throat> perseveres really well under persecution. 
So a lot of times they want to enlighten outsiders to strengths that their society and culture have that might not be apparent. Um, another question I ask a lot of times is, if you could tell an American anything, what would it be? And a lot of times they'll kind of snicker at that one and look up at you like, are you serious? Do you really want me to tell you? And I say, yeah, I want to hear. At that point, it's like, I'm so glad you asked. You better sit down. And, you know, like 20 minutes later, they just open a whole can of whatever on me. Um, but you know what? It's really good to air it out because the fact is there's all that kind of junk that's bottled up. And it's been bottled up for decades as they've seen one missionary after another and another short-term mission trip and another hotshot young missiologically trained 22-year-old who knows the ways of the world whatever. And uh, they've seen an endless stream of that from, the, from everywhere and they've followed it up a long time because, for a couple reasons. One is because they know where money comes from and they know they need money. Another is a lot of times they come from passive cultures. They're just polite people. They're very indirect. And so they bottle it up and bottle it up and bottle up. It'll come out though. And you see the same thing in the American South with African Americans. So like I said, the global currents, they all come home to roost domestically. Everything I've learned about mutuality, about post-colonialism, every bit of it, I need to know when I deal with African Americans in the city of Richmond, Virginia. And it's the exact same thing. I know these people carry around just bottles and bottles of stuffed up stuff. Toxic filled with toxic stuff. And first you need to earn the trust and you need to demonstrate to them that you really are there to learn and you really are humble and you really are not in a hurry. And after a while uh, they get to believe you. So um, I don't think that's a bad thing. I, I think again it goes back to the same as a parent. I have kids who are 24, 23, and 21 and I need to learn how to deal with them as adults and uh, and as partners and and uh, it's the same kind of thing when we go around the world now and I think Americans are beginning to learn that one of the questions I've asked is in my global church listening tour was um, are missionaries changing in the way they relate to your people and the answer was usually yes so that's a very good thing, but and that's a long answer. Your question was, what's the most important global current? I think the answer is mutuality because that undergirds everything. Every, every ministry, outreach, initiative, relationship you want with these folks. Um, mutuality is, the, is a key. Uh, one thing I've said is that, um, you know how with... Uh, stage actors and plays they have to like do these dramatic motions and if you ever see it up front it looks really stupid it doesn't look natural but from the back of the auditorium the re reason they do that is so that it looks natural from a distance if they just act normally it would be really flat so you have to overact I think it's the same thing with Americans when we go into the field uh, to the mission field I think we need to over demonstrate our desire to learn and to partner because they do not expect that. Their assumptions are going to be different. And so I think it's never, you can never go wrong uh, being overt about your humility and what you don't know. Um, and, and that's not to say, hi, I'm Fritz. So glad to meet you. I'm a very, very humble man. I'm not saying that, but it is to say, you know, I, boy, you've been ministering in this town for 20 years. I'd be so interested to hear about um, what that's like. What, what do people look to you for, and how has that changed? And there's so much I can't understand about your town as an outsider. Can you help me understand it better? 
those are great questions and people almost always want to talk about themselves. So I, I found that to be very rich and especially since I do like to listen and to learn. Okay, thank you so much. Let's have Courtney and Michaela. Okay, I hope this question makes sense. Um, in class, we've had discussion about um, how we think missions going to go in relation to Mission Wire and Apple Guy. Um, we kind of decided collectively that we don't think Mission Wire will be necessary in the future, but um, there's going to be more presence of Apple Guys going out and equipping um, natives for indigenous, for mission, well, kind of indigenous leadership and um, yeah. Right. So um, I just wonder what your opinion is on that. Do you think new arms will still be necessary, or do you think, like kind of like us, that maybe they're going to be phased out at some point? Yeah, that's a great question. Just this morning, I was uh, skyping with uh, uh, about a 20-year missionary in Indonesia, and he is um, he works for uh, CBN, you know, the 700 Club and they have something called Operation Blessing. Anyway, he's been there for 20 years, and he's married to an Indonesian lady, and most of his relatives are Muslims. He's an American. Um, I think there will always be a, a, a place for those kinds of people, and I think it's really good, too, because their understandings and insights into the culture are invaluable. I, I, I'm such a, I have such a high regard, and let me say even a... Uh, a healthy fear of what I don't know and never can know about different cultures. Uh, cultures are so um, opaque and they're so entrenched and they're often code. What I mean by that is that they're not written out, they're not spelled out, they're not explained, they're just something you need to know. It's like the, the saying, if you want to learn about water, don't ask a fish. And, uh, and, and so I think the place of long-term missionaries is always going to be there. And that's a good thing because I think God is always going to call people to that. And there's a special richness that comes with going to another country and diving deep and really getting to understand them and love them and become one of them. So I think that will always be there. But I think you're exactly right that the, um, we would be wrong to assume that uh, long-term missionaries will play as central a role in the future as they have in the past. There's no way. Uh, number of long-term missionaries being sent by agencies is down. Uh, giving to, the, to them is down. Um, the number of short-term trips is certainly up. And even for people who go for a year or a couple years, um, I, I don't think it's with the expectation anymore necessarily that it's going to be forever or for a lifetime. So, also the era when that was was needed has changed a lot because now we can get all around the world within a day or two, and uh, we can go back and forth easier than ever before. And also those places where we used to go long term now are raising up their own indigenous leaders and uh, have resources they didn't used to. So the whole mix is scrambled. And I do not think that Mission Warm is going to be the model of the future. Uh, so I think you're exactly right about that. Now, I mean, that means the really smart guys and ladies who run mission agencies need to figure out how we can, we can continue to um, perpetuate our mission and the things we want to do for the kingdom. How do we continue to try to spread the Great Commission? How do we try to fulfill the Great Commandment? Uh, with short timers. Well, that becomes kind of a uh, logistical and strategical question for people that run agencies. And I, that's what I would encourage them to do constantly, is to sit down, get your smartest people in a room with a whiteboard, make sure they come from the U.S., from other countries, and get them together and figure out, okay, if we want to be around in 20 years, let's assume uh, long-term missionaries, lifetime missionaries are going to comprise, I don't know, X percentage of that, whereas they were 10X 
20 years ago or 30 years ago. So how do we need to tweak our model in order to, to retain our effectiveness in a completely changed future? That begins to sound more like a business planning mission than an old missionary planning mission, doesn't it? And, and I like that. But I think it takes really smart people who go in with eyes wide open and aren't assuming that things are going to look in the future like they did in the past. Because that's a, and you know what? I don't find that many people are really interested in that or able to do that. I, I don't think it means I'm special. It just means that I, certain parts of puzzles interest me. And uh, I don't think there are that many people who want to look at this big issue from 30,000 feet, have it be informed by granular on-the-ground feedback from the U.S. and abroad, and uh, figure out what should we change so that it will work in 2025. I don't think there are that many people that find that to be just a, a, a delicious challenge. Um, I do, but... Um, yeah, I, uh, and, and I guess that's part of what I was hoping to do with the book was to help people see just how strategic and, and exciting missions is to welcome the change, to identify it, and to find it really exciting to think about where this is going. But uh, I didn't quit my day job. <laughs> I'm not banking on that happening. Thank you. Sure. Good question. These thanks, are thanks uh, Fritz. These these questions are, are just, your responses are just very very profound and and helpful. We've got a whole class with lots of questions, so let's see how many we can cover. Great. Michaela is next. We'll go to the we'll go to the lightning round now, <laughs> and I will confine my answers to like ninety. Do 120 seconds. Go. <laughs> um, my name is Michaela. I'm a ministry major with an emphasis on missions. And my question is about the Mercy Generation. And why do you think the Mercy Generation is so fearless or risk taking? That's described in the book. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts were on that. Um, I think um, I think they're actually experience oriented. And uh, I think they've grown up with their parents trying to give them just a wide variety of experiences and to send them to camps and to send them on mission trips and to um, uh, give them special classes and internships and things like that. And so I think as they go into the world, they uh, also expect that they're going to just have lots and lots of different experiences. So... Um, They've also been exposed to the world so much more than people in the past. I mean, you know, it's ancient history, but when I was growing up, um, we all we had was National Geographic. National Geographic came out once a week, I mean a month, with beautiful photos from around the world. We didn't have cable channels from all around the world. We didn't have daily news feeds or Twitter from, uh, you know, a square in Cairo or things like that. So... <clears throat> the accessibility and the uh, um, how well we could relate to those things in our everyday life in Sterling or Wichita or Colorado um, was very different than it is today. So you asked, you talked about a fearlessness. I think there is a um, openness and an assumption that the world is mine. I can go wherever I want. I can do whatever I want, and there's nothing stopping me. And the internet fuels that also. So things that formerly seemed so exotic and distant and removed and otherworldly. Uh, nowadays, my kids just grew up assuming, yeah, I can Skype with them. No biggie. That's just, I mean, that's happened in 40 years. It's remarkable. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. Where'd you lose me? Well, right when I was talking about monoculture? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Are you ready for a new question, Fritz? Yeah, I, I, I took about 110 seconds on that. Okay, perfect. <laughs> this is John. Hi, my name is John. Uh, I'm a senior uh, studying Christian ministries with an emphasis in urban ministry. 
uh, one of the things I want to do with my life is actually train uh, church leaders, both at home and abroad. Um, and one of, in reading your book, one of my concern, one of the, a concern that I had was uh, some of the influences on the mercy generation. Uh, I know you talked about mediation as far as we needing it for a lot of splinter groups, but there's a lot of popular writing right now that borders on heretical or crosses that line. Uh, and one of my concerns is how are we going to, um, how, how do we promote orthodoxy? How do we continue to make sure that we're true to the gospel message as we go forward uh, when a lot of the influences on our generation have strayed away from that one way or another? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> You know, um, the mercy generation, it's been so interesting. I've defined a trend, uh, in my mind, as something that younger people don't view it as a trend because they assume it's always been that way. Older people don't view it as a trend because they assume nothing has changed. So like with the mercy generation, old people assume everything still revolves around evangelism. Young people assume it's always been about mercy. And so they're not necessarily t talking about it, but they're assuming different things. When your parents grew up and, and when I grew up, uh, it was evangelism. There was this four spiritual laws. There was evangelism explosion. There was Josh McDowell, evidence that demands a verdict, apologetics. There was campus crusade. Uh, I mean, everything was evangelism. And now us old people look at you guys and say, gosh, it's all mercy. If they're very they're very soft on the whole salvific evangelism thing, aren't they? And some old people think this is terrible. They're just uh, giving away the farm. They think it's all about doing good and helping slaves and all that stuff. We need to bring people to Christ. And um, what I think is that your generation is deeply committed to Jesus being the only answer but that you want to express that in different ways than your parents did. And you don't just simply want to evangelize. That's why in the book I call it, you're an evangelism to group of people. You want to save the slaves. You want to save the earth. You want to feed the hungry. You want to clothe the naked. And you want to do evangelism too. It's all part of it. It's more integrated. Um, but that concerns older people. And what I've told older people, older people is that another good thing about your generation is you are open to cross-generational mentoring. I think that you, my experience has been that millennials desire relationships with older people. And so I think this is an age for discipleship, for older people to come alongside younger people and say, this is so wonderful, this mercy heart that you have beating inside of you. And we want to walk alongside you and also work with you to give voice to that through evangelism also. So I'd encourage you all to see, uh, seek out older mentors. And I think you'd be surprised at how many of them would be willing to do that. Um, but to your point about syncretism, basically, that is one of the challenges when you're a mediator, when you try to be a middle person and how to stand for orthodoxy and for biblical principles while at the same time reaching out to someone else. Let me give you one example and I'm going a little long on this one but one time I was talking to a friend of mine who's a Muslim cab driver and uh, we were talking about his faith. I was asking him all about it because they go and buy I guess a lamb and they slaughter it and I asked him where do you get that and how do you do that here in Richmond and all that and, uh, and it, as he was dropping me off he said well you know you're a man of faith, Fritz, and we all believe the same thing anyway. And I told him, I said, uh, Hamad, actually, we don't. Um, I really admire you because you're a devout man, and you take your faith so seriously. And in fact, I have more in common with you, Hamad, than I do with many Americans who call themselves Christians, who aren't serious about their faith. So I really admire you. I have to tell you that we believe different things because you believe that Jesus was a great prophet. I believe that he came, he was God's son, he died, and he rose. 
And those are the main things to me and my faith. And so that's very different than yours, but it's faith. And I put all of my chips in that square, and you put all yours in another square. And uh, it's fun to walk alongside you as another man of devout faith. So I just wanted to be clear with him and say, here are the things I stand for, but at the same time be very respectful for another devout seeker who has reached some different conclusions. It's not my job to seal the deal. It's also not my job to uh, chastise him for decisions he's made, but I do want to speak lovingly and clearly about what I believe. I think that's one way to avoid syncretism. And what happens is the more you put yourself in situations where you're working with people different than you, it's like a laboratory or, or a, a fitness center. You get to work out those muscles and you learn how to be fluent in this language and stand up for what you believe while also honoring what they believe without fracturing a relationship. So I really encourage you to do that workout, that fitness laboratory stuff where you learn how to uh, affirm and be loving to others and uh, but but also stand your ground and I it, it's the same with Muslims it's the same with postmoderns it's the same with um, it's just a a kind of language and I remember one time Tim Kellers came to Richmond you know the pastor of Redeemer in New York and uh, he spoke at a uh, the church of a friend of mine who's very liberal and my friend said afterwards, gosh, I love Keller's language. And I told Keller that. And he said, well, thank you. I work very hard at that. I try really hard to find language that's very clear and theologically grounded without being judgmental towards others. And if you listen to Keller or read his stuff, you can see that. Well, you touched quite a bit on my question um, just now, but my name is Dixie. Um, I'm a freshman here, and I'm a biblical studies major. Um, so you talk a lot about how you spend, um, it, okay, in your chapter on mediation, you talked a lot about like your time that you spent with people of the, of the Muslim faith and stuff, and I was wondering, um, do you also spend time with other people groups practicing mediation among them and if so just what are they and how do you do that with different groups because like different religious groups and other things they're just so vastly the differences are amazing so yeah yeah the answer is the answer is no I don't um, I mean I, I spend it with people of different ethnicities um, and I try to be around people of different ages a lot. Um, and I think all of that helps me find language that is accessible to people who are, di are different than me. But no, I, I, um, I'm around Buddhists a lot when I go to Myanmar. Yeah. Um, but I don't know the ins and outs of all the faiths equally well. And I think that when we you know, you, when you go to another country or you're dealing with certain kinds of um, religious groups, it's important to understand their theologies. So, I, I now, I think I've had the most intentional dialogues in my city with Muslims. And that's been very interesting because, you know, conservative Muslims have an awful lot in common with conservative Christians in terms of their social stances. You think about political and social stances of conservative Christians, conservative U.S. Muslims are going to line up very similarly on most of those. So when you meet with them, you have something in common. I'll give you one example. Um, a Muslim couple friend of mine, we had them to dinner one time, and uh, they asked Val and me for advice on how to protect their children who are in public school during Halloween season so that they don't just buy into all of that either materialistic or evil stuff with spirits. And so they asked us for you, you as Christians, you tried to shelter your kids, how did you do it? 
Isn't that a neat discussion with a Muslim mom and dad who are raising their kids in public schools? I think that's exactly I think that's exactly the kind of discussion Jesus would have had. Uh, I think he might have been having that discussion more than leading a Bible study. Now, he wouldn't have been thinking the things I thought the next day about one thing or another. So, so similarities end pretty quickly. But um, hey, Fritz, I'm sorry we lost you. Can we can we start with another question? Yep. Okay. Okay, Tanessa. Hi. Hey. My name is Tanessa, and I'm a freshman here at Sterling. Uh, my major is business with an emphasis in social entrepreneurship. Um, but I plan on going into missions. This isn't a question that I initially planned on asking, but Dixie inspired it. Uh, have you ever had an experience uh, where you talk to someone of a different faith and they've been upset with you, or they like they responded negatively? Instead of being like, oh, I appreciate your devout faith and asking you for advice, have they been like, I don't know, disgusted with you or mad at you? You know, what's actually happened more often is that I've gotten those reactions from Christians. Uh, where I'll be talking about mediation and uh, someone will come up afterwards and basically say, I feel sorry for you. And I said, oh, well, what, what do you mean? They said, you're just so naive that you believe all that, uh, of that, that these people are here to be our friends. Um, I had another person one time walk out of a talk when I uh, began talking about social justice uh, because they... Uh, I had been led to believe by probably radio talk show hosts and others that that is code word for liberal politics. And so um, I think this idea about mediation, for instance, is very threatening I, uh, to many. I think it's misunderstood by many, especially people my age who want to see things in black and white and who really buy into the culture wars. One thing I believe about your generation is that you all are so over the culture wars that you don't want to go around fighting and being angry. And I mean, and, and one thing Apple guy has to deal with in the post-culture war era is what do you do when you've lost issues like gay marriage and what do you do when you aren't interested in fighting the abortion wars your parents fought but I don't think I don't sense that same resolve in your generation to keep up those wars and so society changes and that's a bad thing and but when I talk about that mediation role that's kind of more the negative feedback that I get. And I'm conservative in most ways, um, but not conservative enough for some people. So uh, that's the main pushback I get. And, and I have to admit, I'm not one uh, who goes out and evangelizes on the streets in India with Hindus or, you know, who's on the street corner or, or evangelizing. Buddhists in Tokyo, some of these really hard places and hard things. That's not my, that's not been my pattern to date. I've been more uh, trying to help shape minds here um, in the U.S. and to expand minds, and it gets pushed back sometimes. Thank you. Well, I think we're running out of time, Fritz, but let's, David, see if you and Caitlin can still get in a quick question. Um, hi, my name is David. I'm a senior here, um, a biology major. Um, my question is, um, 
where do you see, or how do you see the church in the United States um, in the future in comparison to uh, the global church for the rest of the world? Um, I think, uh, first of all, uh, I, I'm really bullish on the American church. I think it's played an amazing role in the past. I think the American church has been one of God's gifts to the world. Uh, imperfect as it is, it has really ru uh, run faithfully um, its leg during the last century and served the world um, generously, nobly. Um, I think in the future we're not going to have the same leadership role. I think we need to play a more of a mutual role. I still do think that Americans have kind of like uh, natural gifts of leadership, of administration, of project management, of strategy, things like that. If it comes to evangelizing, I don't think we're going to, I mean, I, I'd take a Brazilian anytime. Or I'd take, there are a bunch of people and nationalities that are excellent at that, and they don't need Americans to go over there and evangelize. I think our money is going to continue to be important, but I'm not sure we're going to have more than South Korea or other places. So I think mostly our leadership and our um, those kinds of things. I, I hope we'll continue to look internationally. Um, and uh, I don't think we're going to uh, be able to be the front runners anymore that we've been for the long time. I think we're going to be maybe um, a team of equals. Yeah. Last question, uh, Caitlin. My name is Caitlin. I'm a freshman and I'm a biblical studies major with the intent of using that for a youth ministry. And um, my question deals with monoculture. And in that chapter, you say, Rather, I urge fellow followers of Christ to join me in discerning how to use monoculture for God's good and our own good. And then you follow eventually by saying that a disproportionate number of youth and young adults shape monoculture. So then my question is, um, what would you say would be the easiest way to impact the global youth monoculture? And then also, as Christian young adults, what roles are needed most, or what roles do we need to assume? Wow, that's a good one. Well, I mean, clearly, uh, one of the ways to affect mono, uh, the, gluth, the global youth culture has to be through media. And, uh, you know, currently it's through Twitter. Uh, I've predicted the downfall of Facebook for a while, ever since old people got in. I think, <laughs> I think whenever old people invade a space, the young people go create a new one. Um, and so I think, you know, Twitter, uh, uh, I, I think, and then, you know, I think really staying on top of just what's going on in terms of technology is huge. Um, I, I will never forget, you know, um, if you go on Twitter, older people look at that and think, oh my gosh, I don't care what someone's ordering at the drive through at the, you know, the Burger King. And they just think it's inane, but then I tell them, you can go on and you can search hashtag my life sucks or hashtag Pray for me. It blows your mind what shows up. So I know someone who works on a college campus, and it's a huge one, and he does that. Hashtag pray for me, whatever that campus is, KU, I don't know. And then he'll text, he'll uh, direct message them back and say, I'm praying for you. And so begins a dialogue. So, you know, older people are going to write stuff off and uh, young people figure out how to use the Roman roads that exist and to use them for God and for good. So older people can't get there from here. We barely know, I mean, uh, y'all can follow me on Twitter, by the way, and go on to themeetingofthewaters.com. There's a bunch of good postings there. I, I, I like Twitter a lot. And... Um, but older people can't figure out how to use it creatively. That's up to you guys. That's one thing. The other one is uh, keep up with music, keep up with celebrities. Those are like the lingua franca. And, you know, people, old, people will say, oh, what a terrible thing that those are Justin Bieber's the most important thing today. And the answer is, yes, that's true. That's a horrible sign. But uh, the second thing is, I mean, it's not horrible, but you know, it's. <laughs> I'm stepping on some toes. It, we we can agree that it's superficial. But the other thing is, um, 
All I care is that it is. Older people are going to so often get on high horses and say that's good or bad. I don't really care. I care what is because that's what people are buying into and how do we meet them there without judging them and without saying I'm going to reach out to you even though you are so superficial and I want you to know that this is below me. So I think younger people, I think youth workers are more able to do that than anybody. So that's what I would encourage you. Just keep your, your finger to the wind constantly and figure out what's going on and be nimble. And uh, you'll lose your ability to do that. By the time you get to be about 30, you have a house and you're spending weekends spreading mulch, then uh, you need younger people to do that. I do want to commend you all for uh, your great questions. Thanks for reading my book. Um, you obviously uh, took it seriously, and I really appreciate that. And uh, Hank, thank you so much for having me.